there we go. What was your first ever musical gig? Was it the um, New Jersey Teen Arts Festival? Wow. Really? <laughs> <coughs> wow. <clears throat> you want me to talk about that? Yeah. <coughs> Wow. Okay. I was, when I was 15 years old, I was in high school and I had this thing called the New Jersey teen arts festival. And, uh, I, I don't know if they still do. They did for a while, but anyway, you know, it's a, it, it, it's a way to get kids to share their, uh, creative stuff. Yeah. And um, so I was already writing songs. I started writing songs when I was like 11, something like that, 9, 10, 11, probably 10 or 11. So by the time I was 15 and it was like the Teen Arts Festival, I, I had already been writing songs for a while. So I played, I played guitar and I played drums. And so, you know, I just had some songs, I, you know, I don't even know if I have those songs anywhere, like the lyrics or anything. But nevertheless, uh, um, there was, a, and I got up in front of a, a couple of audiences. There was a television show that I sang on. It was like a uh, <clears throat> kind of like a cable show, I guess, before cable. There used to be something called UHF, and uh, it was just like, you know, kind of like, Wayne's world equivalent. And, uh, <laughs> so I like sang on that and, um, I don't know. So yeah, that was, that was kind of the beginning, I guess. Okay. Um, I do. I, let me look something up here. I, I have a list of, uh, my history, which is not complete, but, um, it could be helpful. Well, wow. Like in the sixties, like, so, so I was, uh, 12 years old in 1967. And that's when I really sang my first song in public. Um, okay. and then in 1969, I was a drummer in a band called the creeping fungus blues band. <laughs> and we lasted for about a year. And then I became like a singer songwriter guy. I stepped out from behind the drums and started, you know, playing guitar and singing and writing songs. So mm -hmm. then I was in other bands. I was in a band called, oh man, these names, unbelievable, Green Spit. And, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, actually, my. My solo performance on television was April 19th, 1971. So what's that make me? 16? Um, and um, uh, anyway, so, you know, I was, I, I was also in bands because I played guitar and sang, so I could kind of fit into whatever I could fit into. How about that? Well, because the next thing I had was a, rock opera that you did after high school with the band called albatross yeah yeah we, we uh my partner in that band a guy named dusty he was dusty mccallie who now teaches uh music at a college in toronto canada he, he and i uh collaborated on a rock opera uh called the walls of walden and we did that and um you know I took a while to get together, but, and it was an ambitious piece and we only played it once, but mm. it, was all, it was all good, um, experience. And after that was right after that was the Beatlemania. No, then, um, after that, then I started, you know, there was more music in dance bands. And, you know, it's really probably the same thing now. If you're starting out, you can get more um, a, more local gigs if you're playing familiar music, you know, music that mm -hmm. people 
know, music that people, you know, have heard on the radio and stuff. And um, right. so I started playing in cover bands. Uh, you know, I had a couple of cover bands, Flight Ensemble, and then, and, and then there was a group called Source, which was a, a much bigger operation, and, and we toured. But we, it was still a show band, and we yeah, it was unbelievable. We wore, um, jump, you know, matching jumpsuits and platform shoes, and we played the music of Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Paul McCartney and Boss Gags, and whatever was happening. in In 1976 is when I joined that band, so okay. was, that was a big deal for me. And then, and and then after that, I, so I did that for a year or two, and then. And then I became a, uh, and then I went back to sing, being a solo singer. So I, so I was playing cover songs in bars by myself with an acoustic guitar. So I did that for a couple of years, you know. So I, so by, by the time I auditioned for Beatlemania, it was 1978. I had, I had a couple of years' experience uh, playing not only my own music but also other people's music and i to be fair i grew up listening to the beatles and bob dylan and Jimi hendrix and all the music from the 60s i mean i i should go back and say i was born in 1955 which is kind of around the time rock and roll was born but um mm -hmm. so by 1978 that makes me 23 and uh i auditioned for Beatlemania for the role of Paul McCartney. It was a Broadway show at the time, and it had three companies. Uh, one was on Broadway in New York City, one was in Chicago, and one was in Los Angeles. And um, uh, after my debut, I was sent out to perform in Los Angeles. Uh, and my the John in my group, because I was a Paul McCartney, Mm -hmm. John guy was a guy named Marshall Crenshaw. Yeah. And, uh, and he and I are still to this day, very good friends. And, um, so that was cool. I did that for a year. That was a really great thing. I got, <clears throat> I got to really study, uh, every step of the way, the quality was getting higher and higher. And at Beatlemania, um, I really, I had to learn note for note. Uh, how Paul McCartney played his bass parts and how he sang. And right. So I've always said I, I have I didn't go to college. I went to Beatlemania. It was a, if you're gonna if you're gonna you know copy somebody, that's a great place to start. The Beatles are pretty much the canon of classic rock, you might say. Um, mm -hmm. So after Beatlemania, I I joined a, a guy. Jan Hammer was. Uh, influential keyboard player jazz rock fusion guy whose music i loved so i made a record with him um and we toured and then that was around 79 and then soon thereafter i joined a band called helmet boy and we made an album both those albums uh, came out on electro asylum records it's and they were probably right around the same year 79, I guess. Uh, and I mean, that's about it, you know? I mean, I, I'm just giving you my resume. I'm just going down the list. Yeah, well, I was, I was going to ask about that that single that you and Marsh uh, like. Right. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I'll go back. When we were in Beatlemania together, Marshall and I, Marshall came up with this idea of, like, well, first of all, I should tell you that disco music was all the rage. It was just absolutely mm. at the, the peak of the genre uh, in in the mid seventies through the early eighties. So, uh, but it was it was you know for a musician, it kind of got annoying after a while because every song kind of had the same ingredients. And uh, it, there was just such repetition that it was kind of a, a drag. So Marshall came up with this idea of let's, you know, let's put out a record called I Hate Disco Music. 
Um, mm. a, a wacky thought, a wacky idea, and um, but we went for it. And that, yeah, that that was so. That was really my first record. Uh, one side, mm. I hate disco music. The other side was a, a song of mine called Uga Shala Bango. Crazy stuff, yeah. <laughs> And then that was that was really a self um, pressed record. We right. we, we called ourselves the Sides, S I D E S, and um, you know it was just a recording project. It, a really fond memory I do have is uh, when I, you know, so I was in we were in Beatlemania and we played L A for a, a while, and then and then we took it on the road to San Francisco. And after mm -hmm. that, San Diego. But in San Francisco, we were there for months. And I found this recording studio, and we ended up going there, hanging out, recording a lot of music there. Uh, Peter Miller was the name of the guy who owned the studio. Anyway, it was a great time. And that's what that, uh, that song, I Hate Disco Music, came from. Wow. OK. <laughs> So let's see, after Jan Hammer, let's shoot ahead to 1979, 1980. Yeah, because I was curious on the story of Helmet Boy, because there's like no oh. info on <laughs> Oh, that's right. You wanted to know about Helmet Boy. Yeah, I actually liked the album. Wow. That's amazing, man. Um, <laughs> well, uh, in, you know, Beatlemania had... Uh, but there were a bunch of us, and it wasn't just one cast. Um, every every show had two casts. Yeah. There was uh, the New York yeah. show had two casts that alternated shows. The LA sh LA company had two casts that alternated the shows, and the Chicago show had two casts that al alternated the shows. So that means there's six Pauls and six Johns and six Georges and six Ringos working. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was kind of a group of musicians, right? So there was a guy who was in, not in my band, but uh, he was a John from another band, David Leon was his name, is his name to this day, unless he's changed it. And he uh, lives in, he's an LA guy. I'm a New Jersey person. Um, mm -hmm. but but I was on the road with uh, them and I got to know David Leon, who had this band in LA, Helmet Boy, and, and especially in the wake of The Knack, suddenly, you know, The Knack kind of put the nail in the coffin of uh, disco. It was like suddenly there was a, a rock band. Right. Uh, and and they had a, a huge hit record. They were they were a big deal there for about a year. So all the record companies at the time wanted more knacks, bands like the Knack mm -hmm. and songs like My Sharona, their hit. So uh, David Leon's group, Helmet Boy, kind of fit that bill. You know, four white guys from L.A. So. Mm -hmm who play, you know, Rick and Becker guitars and stuff. So um, they were making an album. They got it together. They had a Freddie DeMann was a manager. Jay Center was the producer. Uh, they got a record deal with Electra Asylum. And this is after I did my Jan Hammer thing. But David right. David called me and he said they wanted, would I, would I be interested in joining his band? Um, so I had nothing to lose. It was a, a recording act. And I thought that was cool. So I showed up, I flew in, and I wrote, I probably only wrote one song. I wrote a song, but I ended up singing a, Most a, a be, number yeah. of songs on the record. Uh, it's a, it's a, it was a pretty cool power pop record that just, you know, just never saw the light of day. Not, it was never really promoted. I don't know that I, I don't know that it was ever played on any radio station anywhere <laughs> at any time ever, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but another thing that was going on at that time where bands were doing um, covers of 60s classics. That was a That's big. Was, 
Yeah, because I was I was wondering whose idea that was because I know at the time in 1980 that you know Bernadette Peters had that um, like top 40 hit cover of G Wiz and there were other major label bands that were doing 50s covers. I, I was wondering whose idea was that to do uh, He's a Rebel. I wish I could remember who said it first, but I know that I always loved the song. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I can't take credit. I don't know. I can't remember. You know, it was either, it was probably either the producer or David Leon or myself. And we, um, so, uh, so we, you know, I ended up being singer on that song as well. They, I, I don't know. They, they flew me out because they wanted another member of the band. They wanted, I guess they wanted another voice and they wanted another uh, perspective or influence. So uh, it's possible that I came up with the idea of the she's a rebel. Um, but nevertheless, the idea of changing the gender uh, appealed uh, to all of us too. Right. You know, at the time, punk was happening as well. And, um, you know, the idea of the girl being the tough one, uh, right. you know, it's kind of cool. And to this day, that's like, you know, that's a, that's a cool hook. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So and did you, did you reject the idea of being in the Jessica's girl music video where you just not asked was everybody else asked? What, uh, what about music video? What? How the other band members of Helmet Boy were in the Jesse's Girl music video. Mm. Well, after Helmet Boy was kind of like we put out this album, it was over. Um, uh, the bass player, really good bass player, Richard Grossman from Helmet Boy. Mm. He was a busy guy and, and uh, you know, the, the band kind of went nowhere. We, we, you know, we had no more, um, you know, there was, we had no more juice. It didn't seem like Elektra was going to put out another record on us. So Richard, the bass player, um, he went out and he was getting gigs. He was recording. He was doing different things. Uh, And somehow he got the call to play uh, on Jesse's Girl um, to to shoot the video. So... um, that turned out to be a huge hit. Mm. MTV was just starting right then. So the idea of, uh, you know, having a rock video, um, there was a, there was a need for rock videos. So Richard Grossman playing bass. If, if you look at the video, there's only three guys in the video. Right. And and, uh, the bass player is the guy from helmet boy. So that's, Mm. So that's that connection. That's that's as close as I ever got to to Jesse's girl, which is a great, okay. which is a great song. Yeah. And did you guys never play any gigs around LA or anything? Or was it just the? Yeah. yeah, you know they did before they called me. Before they had the record deal, they played. Okay. Gigs. They played gigs, and they 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 really had some uh, a, a small thing going, mm. uh, and then. A manager came, saw them, liked them, got them a deal with Electra Asylum, and um, and then they called me. So I, I actually never played a live gig with Helmet Boy. And, oh, okay. and, and when Helmet Boy did do live gigs, they never played She's a Rebel or Hurts Like Love. And I think Hurts, oh. like, Hurts like Love was a single off that album as well, and that was a... That was my song. That was something I had written. And uh, so there you go. When was the last time you listened to the album? Wow. (laughs) Probably probably 10 years ago, uh, maybe, if not 20, you know? Because my, I don't know if you would really remember, but my favorite songs on it, are uh, I like this could be the night. I think that was you singing lead on that. It was, yeah. 
and uh, I think Poster Girl is fun. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. But overall, I think it's a pretty strong overlooked album for the genre at the time. Amazing that you found it. How did you find it? You know, that's a rare thing. Looking through lists of um, major label, like power pop bands that got major label deals at the time. And that was like in the list, but it was one that nobody ever talked about. So I was like, oh, I have to, I have to find this and see what it sounds like. <laughs> so are you a power pop guy? I like power pop and then I like um, like pop rock, hard rock stuff from that same time. So it's the era that you're as interested in as the genre? Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Uh, you know, there. <clears throat> I hear that there's a really good uh, documentary on the Go-Go's. And, and I remember when Helmet Boy was rehearsing and stuff, the Go-Go's were creating a uh, a buzz in LA. Uh, so I've been meaning to check out that uh, documentary, but nevertheless, I mean, that era, mm. uh, the late seventies, I guess it was, um, you know, the knack era when power pop became cool again. I mean, you know, there certainly there were power pop bands forever, always before the knack, right. You yeah. know, cheap, cheap trick I think of as being like, you know, Definitive, yeah. yeah, pretty much kings of it, or or some of the kings among the kings of power pop, and they were earlier. They were seventies, but um, but yeah, that that there was this thing where everybody had to wear skinny ties for a while there. Like um, uh, the knack came out wearing suits, you know, black suits, white shirts, skinny ties, mm -hmm. pointy shoes. That was very different than what than the disco era and stuff like that. They, the knack drew heavily from the Beatles. So the, the in look, right. in, in you know, in genre and songwriting and stuff, uh, they added a little punk edge to it. But nevertheless, um, so everybody wore skinny to, or at least all the white guy, all the white bands, you know, all started wearing black suits, white shirts, and skinny ties there. And there were a bunch of bands that did that. And Helmet Boy was among them, you know, in that era. That was part of the deal you had. You know, there was almost a uniform. And that was the fashion of the moment. You know? What was your personal opinion of, you know, like besides New Wave and Power Pop at the time, what was your opinion of, because I know that was also when Pat Benatar and like she was getting huge and like women doing hard rock. Yeah. I was just curious, like, what you thought of it at the time? Because that was kind of a groundbreaking thing. Yeah. Huh. Well, you know, I. It's funny. I. I, I was. I was not interested. I was not as interested in modern music as I was the previous generation's music. You know, I, oh. I I grew up at the tail end of the baby boomers. So I grew up with, you know, the Beatles, Bob Dylan, Jimi Hendrix, and, you know, folk music I was into and, you know, earlier on. And, and so, right. you know, it was, I was more of a hippie kind of guy. Steely Dan was happening at that, at the same time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, and I was into com the complexities of that. And in the seventies, I, you know, I fell in love with Yes and Gentle Giant and some of these prog bands. Mm -hmm. so, so I was a, I was probably more interested in the older acts, the slightly older acts. Okay. And, um, you know, I was a huge Stevie Wonder fan. But, um, uh, you know, so what was happening, I was just in a competitive mode with that. So okay. I was keeping track and appreciating uh, what was going on in the era pa and paying attention to the, the songwriting uh, and the ingredients of what was popular in music so that I right. could, you know, I could kind of, uh, you know, emulate that and, and maybe get in the running uh, that way in the songwriting. And, and, and it was, 
there was a really great retro thing about it, actually. Um, as you said, there were a lot of people cutting re remakes of songs that were 20 years old at the time, or 10 or 20 years old. But yeah. um, and, and, and that was a really good thing about uh, new wave music uh, and uh, power pop was that it wasn't they, they weren't as interested we weren't as interested in the slickness of it as we were the raw energy of it and 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 looking back to um you know power pop owes as much to buddy holly as it does to you know the knack or or cheap trick you know um so it's uh so I like that. You know, I, I'm kind of a historian in a way. I, you know, I certainly appreciate uh, the history of popular music. And um, so being a fan of all of it, um, you know, I drew from those, uh, from all of those uh, genres, if I could, in my songwriting and stuff. Did you have any in that early period in, in LA, like in 78 to 80, 81, did you have any encounters with like well-known musicians or anything like that? Hmm. Uh, yeah, you know, I got to think about this. Um, I lived right off of the Sunset Strip, right near what was Tower Records. Um, and, you know, walking distance to, uh, the rainbow which was like a rock and roll hangout and um yeah. and one night i was upstairs hanging out and uh and i was at the bar with phil linnett from thin lizzie mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and uh the who's bass player I'm really embarrassed to write. I just woke up, so I'm really embarrassed. I'm forgetting his name, but the, the great bassist from The Who was there. So we were, so I'm, I'm hanging out there at the bar, and it's the three of us. So we chatted a bit, you know. Um, I met Jeff Beck at the Rainbow, who I'm to this day a big fan of. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, I might have met some more people. Um, I remember in a rehearsal studio one time running into Ginger Baker. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So there was some of that. I stood in the post office line with uh, Olivia Newton-John once. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, there were... There were <clears throat> yeah, I, actually, if you hang out in Hollywood, you will see a lot of Right. Invariably, you'll see some, you know, movie star or something. <clears throat> so what? What did you do between, um, like eighty one and whenever you got the A and M deal? <clears throat> I got the eighty one. Uh, I got the A and M deal like in eighty five or eighty six. Uh, <clears throat> I I was in. A, a band in uh, because I live in New Jersey. I moved back to New Jersey and uh, like immediately afterward. Soon thereafter, yeah. And I got married, uh, and there was a scene happening in Asbury Park. This is kind of in the wake of Bruce Springsteen was on his way up, and right. uh, so I um, so I joined a band, uh, the house band at the Stone Pony. Stone Pony being a famous bar in Asbury Park. Uh, and at the time, the house band uh, was a, a group called Cats on a Smooth Surface, which I uh, I joined, I played with for a year or two. And that was predominantly cover music. And I was uh, uninspired by just playing cover music. And, uh, you know, this is... This is probably a theme throughout my life. It's like I, I, I write music, and but there's, there's always a call to play more familiar music to people. You know, if my music isn't successful, so 
it is successful at times, but it is not my bread and butter all the time. Sometimes it is, usually isn't. But so after Cats on a Smooth Surface, I started my own group, got a recording deal with A&M Records and uh, recorded two albums for A&M as Glenn Burtnick. Dropping the N, my real name is Glenn with two N's. Uh, I decided to drop the second N for my solo deal. I can't remember how I spelled it with uh, Jan Hammer or um, Helmet Boy, but I think that was the first time I dropped a letter from my name. Do you have a preference between which one of your solo albums you like better? Uh, they're very different to me. Um, I took more control of the second one, Heroes and Zeros. I think it's a harder hitting album. The first one, Talking in Code, has some very good songs on it. Um, but it's a little slicker than I think I should have had for a solo album. Um, there was a song I wrote with a guy named Tony O.K., uh, called Perfect World on the first album that has been cut yeah. so many times and it's been in two or three movies. Yeah, but, I noticed that. Yeah, but it's still, it, it, it never became a hit record. There's a lot of believers in the song and it's a good song. It's a, it's a good ballad and certainly uh, Tony O.K. Uh, he's a great collaborator, great songwriter and uh, he wrote the lion's share of the lyrics which are really good. Um, so, um, you know, so there's some, there's some moments on, um, talking in code, but I, I feel a lot more, there's a lot more of me in, uh, heroes and zeros. You know, I produced it with my friend, David Prater, who went on to, uh, to become a successful producer. Uh, and we recorded it in a basement and, um, and, uh, I, I like that album a lot. And there, there was a, like a, a radio hit of sorts with a song called follow you off of that album. Yeah. Um, and at the time I was also a big, uh, well, I, I was friendly with Neil Schoen of mm -hmm. Berlin, and I was a big fan of Bruce Hornsby's I, I just, uh, great singer, songwriter, pianist. And, uh, I had the two of them did make perf uh, appearances on my second album. So I was really proud of that too. That's going back. I wanted to ask you. There was a single that you did with Neil Schoen, uh, in '82, I think. Sounds right. Yeah, yeah, right. I was. It was just before I joined Cats on the Smooth Surface. I <clears throat> Jan Hammer called me up and he he was working with Neil Schoen, but they weren't getting along. And he said, "You know, they're recording an album and they need a single. Can I come up and help?" Okay. So I came up and I and the three of us wrote a song in a weekend. We probably one day. Uh, we recorded the, the rhythm track and at night I went to bed and wrote the lyrics. And the next day I gave them to, to Neil and I showed him how to sing the song the way I was hearing it. And um, and it turned out to be the song "No More Lies," uh, which got a lot of MTV airplay as a video. Um, and I played bass on it and, and even sang some of the lines. You can't tell, but it's me. But, um, yeah, so that was that. And that was a big deal for me, um, having a song on MTV that I wrote. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was fun. You guys were never, when you were in Helmet Boy, you were never asked to do a video because that was kind of mm -hmm. before MTV. Yeah, well, I think it was before or thereabouts, but no, we weren't, you know, that, that was ex an expense and really, um, right. you know, Electro Asylum just didn't, didn't really invest in Helmet Boy at all. So, uh, I can't remember the details and why our manager couldn't get that kind of uh, situation, but, uh, it, I, you know, it, it might have just been a money grab for those guys, you know. Um, but no, we weren't asked. It's too bad because, and, and I'm flattered by um, it's a compliment that that uh, s someone 
who wasn't around all those years ago um, would even know that album because that's a really, it really didn't sell and it, and it's a really forgotten, you know, unknown. I mean, even when it came out, I, I don't, I can't imagine it selling, you know, a thousand copies even. I don't know. Well, I've always been, as I got older, I've always been into looking back into like, I don't know, major artists that I'm a fan of that had like major label albums early in their early in their career that didn't go anywhere. That's how I found out about Michael Bolton and Blackjack. And that and that, that's like one of my favorite bands now. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a cool thing. I, uh, you know, similarly, I get into old, you know, music that predates me, um, jazz mm -hmm. and blues and uh, country records that, you know, I mean, I, on, you know, in my car, I listen to 40s music, you know, on the Sirius XM, oh. you know, so it's, uh, it's, right. it's, not, it's very similar. Uh, you know, 40s music was before I was born and certainly 80s music was before you were born or 70s music as well. Right. So then after your solo albums, how long before you got asked to join Sticks? Oh, you know, a year or two. Uh, Tommy Shaw, the Sticks had broken up. Uh, and then they were talking about getting back together. And by the time they were all ready to get back together, Tommy wasn't. Tommy was busy with a band called Damn Damn Yankees. Yeah. And so they needed, so they, and they were like, let's do this. We'll, we're going to do it without Tommy. So, <clears throat> so that I was asked. Um, so at the time I had a bunch of songs that I was, Hope I was I had been planning to release on my third A and M album, but which was never to be. So mm -hmm. I had the songs and I showed them the sticks and they were interested and I became the substitute for Tommy Shaw, like sort of. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a different sound. There was a different thing that I added to the band. Um, and you know, by then the band had past their peak in terms right. of hits and uh you know we had hits off the album i made with them edge of the century but um it wasn't their glory days and um so i think that I, the idea of my not being uh, my not being tommy shaw uh didn't help uh them trying to reclaim their uh success as big as it had been but uh it was a good experience for me it was it was fun i i've always said it was like playing rock star um you know the, it, you know we'd walk out on stage and there'd be thousands of people singing along and screaming and, and you know and treating us you know treating the band like we're stars and maybe they were but i was just you know the new guy and i was given a lot of rope you know right. i wrote the title track for the album and and this, the first single, and I sang a lot of the songs and all this stuff. But um, you know, um, it it, it re I really wasn't a rock star. I, I still not. I was never a rock star. But um, but it was fun to play one, make believe. That's what I was going to ask. If there was, if you're feeling a lot of pressure joining them, or was it kind of not as things mm -hmm. anxious? There, uh, there might have been some pressure, but I didn't care. I didn't think okay. about it that much. It was, it, you know, it was an opportunity is what it was. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, let me step in here and let me see if I can give these guys the hit they need, you know. And as it turned out, I didn't, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I didn't really pay attention to the, the pressure. I'm sure there was. I'm sure that the... You know, it was a really weird thing, too, because Sticks was on A&M Records, which was the same right. label that I had been on. And um, so the promotional staff, uh, everybody at the label, they had just worked with me a year or two earlier. Yeah. Uh, so everybody yeah. knew me. I think I was well-liked. Um, 
So I don't think that there was, but I'm sure Tommy was well liked. Um, I, you know, so, so I don't know. I, 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 the label might have felt like it's too bad. Uh, Tommy's here and Glenn's taking his place. Whatever. I mean, it, it would all be different if we had had a hit record with you know, like I said, the first single was my song "Love Is a Ritual." If had that been a hit record, is you know a different story. It would have been like Glenn Burtnick is the new member of Sticks who has, you know, who who has saved the day, but it didn't really turn out that way. And so be it. You know, um, the Sticks audience wasn't exactly my audience, or, or even the same type of audience. Sticks is a very Midwestern kind of uh, band. <clears throat> Um, and I mean, they're, they're following us deep in America and, uh, you know, and I don't know that I was that kind of artist or that I've been that kind of artist. Mm, yeah. Cause, I mean, what, in your later albums and your solo albums vocally kind of remind me of, I don't know, like, well, it's kind of obscure, but I know, you know, who Stan Meissner is and it's kind of that same, kind of that same sound. Yeah, he's a talented guy. I saw him last year um, for the first time in decades. Uh, yeah, I, I I guess, you know, I'm a power pop guy. Uh, I, But I, I really have a, a, a wide spectrum that I love of music that I love. And every time I've made an album, which mm. by now – the format of album is kind of a questionable thing, but nevertheless, every time I've made an album, I've really tried to make a different, you know, recreate myself, reinvent myself. Yeah. Uh, you know, and um, so talking in code was kind of a synth pop thing with drum machines and synthesizers. Uh, Heroes and Zeros was more guitar driven rocker, you know, pop rock. Uh, a little heavier uh, then you know with sticks I tried to up the ante and become a little more corporate rock then I put out an album called Palookaville solo album called Palookaville where I I really became like an acoustic singer songwriter but I also drew heavily on my love for arranging and using different instruments yeah, uh, you know, violins and and horns, and I was playing more piano on that record. And then after that, acousticy singer songwriter album, I put out an album called "Welcome to Hollywood." And this was after I left Sticks for the second time. I put out an album that totally like the most produced, heavily, you know, and rocked up. Uh, mm. record that I, I've ever made and that was Welcome to Hollywood um, so I, I I see anyway I see all those albums as being you know very different people even though it's I don't know maybe maybe it's just in my mind but because I'm the guy singing on them but but really yeah. I think of it I think of them all as uh, me just trying on different hats mm -hmm. and see if anything works but and then after you, after the first time you were in Sticks, you went to writing for like Robin Beck and Patty Smythe, and um, yeah, how how did that work or come like come about? But the song with that her and Don Henley, I became really uh, involved in songwriting by that point. You know, after that first Sticks album, where I, uh, you know, I wrote maybe half the album. Um, I moved on to take myself seriously as a songwriter for others. Mm -hmm. um, while I still had a solo thing happening on the side, but I became really interested in uh, my songwriting as something maybe I could sell to others. Uh, and, uh, you know, I began writing with John Waite and Patti Smythe. I mean, I, I, I would see an artist that I admired and I, you know, and I, hook up with them and I'd say, let's see if we can write a, a hit song together or a song for your project. And uh, Patty's manager at the time, Mark Spector, uh, 
was impressed with my work and suggested she meet with me. So we we met and uh, we wrote a number of songs and uh, eventually, uh, you know, and one of those songs was Sometimes Love Just Ain't Enough. And yeah. Patty, who was friends with Don Henley, showed him the song and the chorus of the song was, um, I, I always sang a, a harmony with her on it. And when she showed, the, she showed Don Henley the song, she showed him my harmony. He probably heard it on the demos. And, uh, and he, he said, I want to sing this with you. So he, he sang the part that I had, you know, invented with her when we wrote this song together. And yeah. I was really happy that he did because he was, he was at the peak of his solo career at that point. And when mm -hmm. they, released, when they finally released that album, uh, that single, it was a big hit. So it kind of, it was my first big hit record. Did you ever meet him? Never met Don Henley. Okay. <laughs> when you were uh, meet with people like Desmond Child or Billy Steinberg or any of the like huge songwriters? Um, <clears throat> not really. I, I did... I was doing a lot of things in that period. I was singing sessions. I was singing on jingles, like advertisements. Mm -hmm. I, in addition to putting out solo albums occasionally, writing songs for other people. And, uh, you know, I was just wearing as many hats as I could. And I sang a, a number of uh, sessions for Jim Steinman. Uh, oh, for uh, his his work with meatloaf and uh yeah a few other things but predominantly a couple, a couple of meatloaf records oh celine dion i uh there was a uh jim steinman record that's uh or a celine dion record that jim steinman wrote and produced and i was asked to sing i was one of the many background singers you know there were a few of us four maybe of us um and uh, all coming back to me now was a, the single is a big hit for her. So that was, uh, but I didn't write it, but I sang on it. I was a, a background singer. So that was a nice little, um, you know, uh, pat on the back as well. Being on, being involved in such a big hit record as that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that until now because I don't think that was listed on uh, <clears throat> credits. I for you yeah jim simon was a really talented guy amazing um songwriter you know and producer and he did all that meatloaf stuff and uh bonnie tyler and air supplies and a lot mm. of big records was there anybody that you like wanted to work with that you or write for that you didn't get a chance to or that you tried hard to <clears throat> meet probably you know I, I i it i was very opportunistic at the time so i would have written with anybody to be <clears throat> excuse me to be to be honest i was not a fan of sticks i didn't even like sticks. yeah mm -hmm. um but uh, but they were successful and i respect that and i was so i was like well i'll sure i'll join that band you know maybe i can help them and maybe it will help me you know so i was pretty opportunistic um you know i'm a working musician so i'll i'll, I'll take a job if it uh if it seems like a good idea um so i would have probably written with anybody <clears throat> i wrote with lita ford yeah um, you know, not, she's not particularly known as a great singer songwriter, but she is an artist. She's a, kind of iconic. Um, you know, I'm, I'm forgetting, I'm sure I'm forgetting a lot of the people that I, I, I worked with, but, um, yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was up for anything. Did you, did you try to, I mean, I know there's not from at least what I saw anyway, there's not really many songwriting credits for you or for other people in the early eighties, but, or like around that time when you were still in LA and there in that 
time did you ever try doing that or like meeting other artists to or were you not really writing that much at that time yeah i wasn't really consider uh, i was still out to be a member of a band uh, in the late 70s early 80s um <clears throat> it was really the 90s when i um you know i kind of started to think well i guess i'm not a i guess i'm not a rock star so maybe i can uh apply my songwriting abilities to uh to other for other artists you know so that happened more in the 90s you know it's too bad that i i never really i didn't get uh my songwriting uh, my publishing kind of thing together until i yeah. met met other people uh, a big a big help was a guy named peter matterin who was an attorney i started you know start started networking with attorneys by the time uh i by the end of the 80s and that's what helped me okay so and then i know around the same time that you were in helmet boy that was when marshall did his first album um were you like asked to play on that or i was kind of surprised that you didn't <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, he, well, he, he had started his own group and he, he lived further away. Uh, and yeah, I was so happy for him. And it's a great record. Um, and we had written a number of songs together, but, but they didn't pop up until later in his career, but, um, uh, on his record, but, um, uh, no, I was just, I was, I was thrilled. I, I, I was kind of amazed that, uh, you know, he, he, in the beginning, Marshall had a trio. He had his brother on drums, and he had this guy, Chris Donato, who was a left-handed bass player. So that is kind of surprising uh, yeah. that I had just, you know, been on the road with Marshall, and I and I was a left-handed bass player with him. But um, I guess we were both busy doing different things, and uh, uh, I, and I will say we're friends to this day. I'm 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 I'm, I'm good friends with Marshall. I like him a lot. Yeah, that's cool. So I guess the last thing is you can tell me more about the band that you're in. Are you the are you the lead singer? Of well, the... yeah, right now I'm in the band. Uh, the Weaklings is the main band, yeah. and uh, and now I'm one of three singers. Actually, all four of us sing. There's just four of us. We, you know, we decided to, you know, let's let's base it on the Beatles. So what what we do live is we play uh, a lot of Beatles songs and we interject our own songs, which are pretty power pop. Um, mm -hmm. And our own songs, well, we put out records and uh, on Gem Records, we have a couple of good records and uh, we've gotten, um, we've, we've gotten a lot of uh, airplay on Sirius XM. The Beatles channel is just playing us this weekend. Uh, Little Stevens Underground Garage has named a, a number of our songs coolest song in the world, and wow. yeah, we're um, so yeah, we have a bunch of power pop songs that we've written and, and that we record on our own albums, but also uh, because our audience is getting older, we uh, we play a lot of Beatles songs live as well to just so that we keep everybody's attention for when we play our our own rocking songs. Okay. And then I think, yeah, the last thing I wanted to ask you is when you were in Helmet Boy, and I know there I know there were so many other bands doing that then, but were you were there any other major label bands that were doing power pop that you liked that you could remember? Or were you not really paying attention? No, I was. I was paying attention and, and that was the genre that we were in. Um you know, Marshall um, and and the Go Go's were you know came out of that LA thing in in a big way. Um, but you know, to this day, I I tip my hat to Cheap Trick, uh, and uh, yeah. you know, I think they're kind of like I said earlier, they're the kings um, or among the kings of power pop. You know, um, I'm sure there were others, but you know. It's a long time ago, so uh, 
You know, Todd Rundgren was always a big uh, influence on me, and uh, he's yeah. he could be a power pop guy at times. You know, he's he has a really wide uh, palette, but um, mm. he's, uh, he's a power popper. Yeah, I think the raspberries are kind of equally as big as like Cheap Trick in that kind of retrospective. Tremendous, tremendous band, great power pop band. Yeah, I love them. Well, thanks. It was nice uh, finding out the info about Helmet Boy, especially because I've been wondering that for a long time. Uh, it's amazing that, you yeah, know, wow, that anybody's asking. So let me ask you about what you do. Like this, do you have like a vlog or something? Or I just, well, I just recently started doing this. Like I, I just got the idea to ask musicians or actors I'm friends with on Facebook or that I've communicated with before stuff they haven't been asked before. And I mean, the first person I interviewed was Billy Steinberg. Right. Um, right yeah. And then tomorrow I'm supposed to interview Tommy Farragher. I don't know. Do you know who that is? Sure. I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so far it's, this is all, that's all I've done. And then a couple of actors I'm with. Are you going to like, so you don't know for sure what you're going to do with it. You, 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 you might write, a, a blog or you might write a book, you know, like, or, or you might put out a series. You don't really, you're not sure. You're just kind of compiling data. Yeah. I'm kind of getting more, more going first. Like I'm, I just set up an interview with Gerard McMahon and uh, I'm waiting to hear back from Desmond child. Cause I talked to his like publicist the other day. So hopefully that'll happen too. Cool. I can, uh, if you like, I mean, uh, let me think about it, but I could probably turn you on to, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, Marshall Crenshaw at the very least, maybe John Waite, um, uh, maybe Patty Smythe. Cause she has a, she has a new record coming out. Um, that would be, that'd be amazing. All right. Let me, let me reach out to them and then I'll see if I can hook you guys up. Okay. Thanks. I'll All be right. sure to, Show you the link once I get it up, once I get this uploaded. Groovy. Yeah. Bye. All right, brother. You take care of yourself. Yeah, you too. Bye.